In this session, we're going to focus on percussion. Percussion is a technique discovered fairly recently by Leopold Owenbruger. The story is that he was an innkeeper's son and he watched his father tapping on casts of wine to see how much wine was left. And from that, when he became a physician in the late 1700s, he discovered percussion. And everything we know about percussion, he described. He used an instrument that they laid on the chest and a tiny hammer. In fact, the present day knee hammer has its genesis from that instrument. But we found that we percuss much better when our finger is the pleximeter and our other hand is the hammer. I know that there are many different ways to do this. I favor your putting your hand firmly against the patient's chest, not keeping the other fingers up because I think it's harder to form a good seal. So push the fingers in, seated nicely in the intercostal spaces, and you're trying to aim for the middle of this phalanx and it's important to keep your fingernails short in order to percuss successfully. Your wrist must be loose, and if you get all these things going, you will have a nice percussion stroke that will serve you very well. You're detecting a slight difference between left and right. And that is quite normal. That is the area of superficial cardiac dullness. And now we're going to go over the surface anatomy of the right side of the lung. Because if you think about it, there's no point in percussing and encountering an abnormality, dullness, say, if you don't know the normal anatomical boundaries and don't know if that's liver or lung. So I'm going to point out some of the surface markings and I'm going to draw them for you. If you were to put your finger in the suprasternal notch and bring your hand down, you would encounter the angle of Louis. It's a very important landmark. This is the suprasternal notch. Because lots of exciting things happen there. It's the level of the right atrium, the trachea bifurcates, the thoracic duct crosses over, the azagous vein joins, uh, it's the lower border of T4. And for us, it's very helpful because the second rib joins right there, and therefore, the space right below it is the second intercostal space. Now, in percussing on the right side, uh, we, we must be conscious of the location of the major fissure because the major fissure will divide, uh, divide things into the upper and lower lobes and the minor fissure. And I'm going to show you an easy way to do that without having to remember too many landmarks and so on. So let me, let me demonstrate by having Jeff turn around for me a second. Now, this is the medial edge of Jeff's scapula with his arm at his side. So if you if you remember this, this is where his scapula is. I'm now going to have him put his hand on top of his head. And a really exciting thing happens is the moment he puts his hand on his head, the lower border of the scapula becomes a, a wonderful landmark for the major fissure. So this is the lower border of the scapula. And if I continue it up and then continue it through the side like so, it will eventually come meet the costal margin at about two, three, four, the sixth rib, right about there. And the median fissure or the horizontal fissure is found by drawing a line from the fourth rib. And if you follow that line, it eventually intersects with the other line. And as you can see, the axilla is the only place where you can see all three lobes of the lung, upper lobe, middle lobe, lower lobe. When you're examining the patient from the back, you're largely dealing with lower lobe with a little smidgen of upper lobe. And when you examine the patient from the front, you're mostly seeing upper lobe with a little silver of the middle lobe and a tiny silver of the lower lobe. In percussing the right side, it's terribly important again to know where the liver is and especially to know the upper border of liver dullness. Because the liver is here, it is dull when you percuss over it. You need to know the upper border so that you can say any dullness above that is fluid or consolidation. And the magic numbers to remember are 579, 579. The fifth rib in the midclavicular line. So here's the second rib, third, fourth, fifth. Right about there's the fifth rib in the midclavicular line. 
The seventh rib in the mid-axillary line, I'm going to turn Jeff a little bit and have you put your hand on your head. And I'm going to find my landmark again. Here's the seventh rib in the mid-axillary line. And the ninth rib, if I can turn you all the way, put your hand down. The ninth rib in the mid-scapular line, the ninth rib, which is about there. So remember the magic numbers five, seven, nine, representing the mid-clavicular line, the mid-axillary line, the mid-scapular line. If you have dullness below that, that's normal, that's liver. If you have dullness above that, especially if it's considerably above that, it's quite abnormal. In percussing the left side of the chest, it's really quite different from the right side. On the right side, you have the solid organ of the liver to contrast its dullness with the resonance of the lung. On the left side, there's a slightly different situation. So on the left side, you have the heart. And as I mentioned before, you have a fist-sized area of dullness, which we call the area of superficial cardiac dullness. Everybody should be dull there. And if they're not, it suggests hyperinflated lung. The pulmonary second space, again, should always be resonant. And if it's not, it suggests perhaps an enlarged pulmonary artery. But the very interesting phenomenon here has to do with the gastric bubble that sits under the rib cage. Here is the lower margin of the rib cage. And the gastric bubble sits underneath there in an area called trop space, which I'm going to outline. Trop space, spelled T-R-A-U-B-E, is formed by dropping a perpendicular on the sixth rib in the midclavicular line. So here's the midclavicular line. Here's the second rib, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So perpendicular from the sixth rib in the midclavicular line. And another perpendicular from the ninth rib in the anterior axillary line. And what you then get is an irregular quadrilateral representing the stomach bubble sitting quite high up. Don't forget the diaphragm is quite a dome even though the costal margin is here. And when we percuss the lung and go down this way, we go from resonance typically to tympany from that large solitary bubble. So listen to this. You hear how it became a much fuller, boxy sound, unlike this sound. And that represents the stomach bubble. It's a useful sign because if you have a pleural effusion on the left lung, it will seep into the costophrenic angle and it will obliterate trop space. Whereas if you have a consolidation of the lung, the lung will be consolidated, the lung sound will be flat, dull, and when you come here, trop space will be preserved because the lung boundary is over there. This represents the costophrenic recess. And so it's a useful sign in that situation. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.